Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Terry Winston. I'm the executive director of Women's Audio Mission, and I could not be more thrilled than to have the amazing producer, recording engineer, mix engineer, Marta Saloni here today with us in conversation talking about uh, how to use vintage synths and tape machines in the recording process, in the mix process. It's gonna be super exciting conversation we're gonna have here. But before I do that, just a little bit about Marta. Uh, she started her career in her native Italy where she spent her early years as a live sound engineer. And after moving to London in 2010, she worked alongside mixer David Wrench on projects for Frank Ocean and the XX, Goldfrapp, FKA Twigs, and David Byrne. And after opening her own studio, she produced and mixed artists including Bjork, Bon Iver, Holly Herndon, MIA, Shura, and a whole bunch more here. And she won, hey, if that's not enough, she won Breakthrough Producer of the Year last year at the Music Producers Guild MPG Awards in, in the UK and is nominated again this year for Producer of the Year. So that's super cool. Also composes and improvises live sets using tape machines, loops, and feedback under her own name and with the ensemble Melos Kalpa and is in the process of opening a charity called Free Youth Orchestra, providing instruments and free workshops to youth and run by local musicians. Please give a big warm welcome to Marta Saloni. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So lovely to meet you. Yeah, I'm so excited to have this conversation with you. Um, you have this really kind of unique and innovative way of using tape machines and vintage synths in the recording process. And it's especially interesting given how, you know, digital and plug-in focused things are these days. So I'd love to just start off talking about that. And can you take us back to the the first time um, you started doing this? Like what, what inspired you to do that uh, and how it evolved into how you're doing that um, today? Yeah. I think the tape machine is the first um, piece of equipment that I bought with my own money when I was still an assistant. So it was uh, this PR99 Revox uh, um, Mark III, which I set my eyes upon and, uh, and thought, you know what, I'm going to get these and it's going to be my very first piece of equipment and I'm going to build a studio from it. So. Um, the reason for that is because I've always been fascinated by the fact that uh, with tape you can actually touch the medium which you're recording music, which for me is very rare because when I started uh, interning at studios, you know, the, the norm was to record digi digitally. So um, it is through choice that you go to tape rather than through necessity of how it used to be. And I, I, wanted, that, I, I wanted to incorporate that in my knowledge as an engineer. Um, so yeah, I thought what's the best way of doing that is probably to just buy myself a tape machine and then explore it uh, in my own time. So that's, that's what I did. Got the tape machine, uh, sat down in front of it and tried to work it out um, on my own really. And uh, yeah, that's, that's how it all started really. That's awesome. Do you remember, so what was the first artist that you kind of used this, this analog process with it must have well uh i started using it on my own composition first to try and which was kind of an exploration i ended up composing because of uh, the exploration i was doing it sounded musical so like feedbacks and uh, loops um and i wanted to try on me before uh, going into you know going to a session and kind of not knowing what i was doing with it i wanted to to learn it through first and then apply it to um, other projects. So yes, I sort of, I was feeding it back onto itself and then realized, oh wow, I can tune this feedback by using the, um, uh, the very speed uh, and the different, the different two sets of speeds and then just getting the right amount of feedback up until it just, um, it just goes bonkers. And so yeah, I guess it was, yeah, through experimentation, I made my own compositions uh, like that. So I was exploring all my own music first before doing it with, uh, on any other projects. <laughs> I guess that <laughs> makes sense. You don't want to do that experiment in the session. Um, and then when, when did that lead to using it on an actual project? Like which, which projects did that lead to where you're like, oh, this would be a great use of this process? I wonder what that was. I mean, I think perhaps it was uh, one of the first albums I produced with Hero Fisher. Um, yeah, so I was called in as a producer a um, long, long time ago now. Uh, but yeah, I brought in, or even I rented out uh, PR99 
uh, same one as the ones that I had. And uh, I started using it to create uh, counter rhythms of the, uh, uh, to the drums. So recording it live with the drummer playing live with the, um, uh, with the tape delays, then I realized, oh, they, this informs how the drummer reacts to what I'm doing with the tapes. And then as kind of like a post-processing, it would change up the rhythm and it would make feel like exciting, sort of something that um, a drummer could not really do. Or so, because it would be just way too many things involved. So uh, it added a level of, um, uh, you know, depth to it, uh, depth for playing or compositions, which I really loved. And um, then I would be doing kind of like, uh, uh, spot feedbacks in which I would be using the sense from the desk to send it to the tape machine and so having these kind of swells and they will stop. Um, yeah, and then pitch shifting as well. I use it, uh, I remember on that album to pitch shift vocals, to pitch shift uh, uh, guitars, all sorts of stuff. I think that was the, yeah, it was my first, like I say, uh, higher production that I did. I went straight in with it. That's super cool. So you're actually patching it in to the desk. So to the aux sends and returns and, and using the tape machine essentially as a signal processor. Yeah, right? like a real time, often in real time, because then from then I realized um, it is like a brilliant communication between the player and uh, uh, the processing that's going on live. Uh, and it does it does change your performance when everything happens at the same time. I do like to use like real time processing when I'm recording, like that, for example. So I mean, I live doing live feedbacks and stuff. It feels like a like a performance on on this side of the glass as well as the other side. That's great. So, um, and are you using this also um, in the mix process, or is it just in the in the tracking part, or are you also doing it? Because I know you mix a lot. I mean, that's yeah, your primary, it. right? It's kind of like, yes. I mean, often well, now with uh, with the, pandem the pandemic and so on, uh, we, we haven't been able to really, like before last month, to really get together in a studio. I've mixed a lot, uh, which has been a blessing, you know, being able to carry on working through it all. Um, but yeah, I do use it a lot in mixing as well. I would, for example, use it as sort of like pre-mastering thing. I would send my mix to the... Um, uh, to the tape machine and then out of the tape machine back into uh, Pro Tools or on the desk, depending how I'm mixing, and then adding on my mastering, uh, not master, pre mastering chain on it. And then it's sending off to mastering. So, yeah, I use it like that. I would use it in mixing again for like um, sort of like delay units, um, uh, saturation a little bit, or like when something does need to have be a little bit. Um, you know, uh, maybe a guitar is lacking a bit of body. I would slam it through it, the uh, PM99. And, and now I've acquired a few more tape machines. So I've got a few flavors of it, depending on what I, what I need to do. So yeah, I use it as much as uh, for production as for mixing as well. Wow, okay. That's, it is, it's interesting because you can do so many things with it. Like you said, it, it kind of replaces a, you know, multi-effects unit um, with the tape machine, which is, and it's unique because it's your own, you know, it's, it's not a preset. I love it. So I, I think yeah. that's super cool. And then let's talk about the vintage synths. I know less about that um, with you. Do you have um, particular synths that you use and are your favorites? And, and then how do you use those in that process as well? Um, I think, you know, I'm, I'm all for simplicity sometimes. So I, I do really love the mini mic as, um, um, Kind of like a tool that I use a lot of the times to to help me through a production. For example, I will use it, um, you know, to kind of like get a get transform a song quite quickly. So if a demo uh, is on the say acoustic guitar or piano, I'll say, okay, well, let's try and just do the same, but like you know, on a very simple line on the minimum to try and bring the song back to like its roots and then build it up again. So it feels like to me is a very versatile sense for that. And um, uh, again, in production or also mixing, it's really good for me to add like a sub bass, maybe for example, in, a, in the choruses to try and, and widen the depth of the, um, 
uh, of that section and just give it that lift, which is not just upwards, but like downwards in the in the frequency spectrum and, and the impact. So to me, this, the, I guess the MOOC would be the first thing that I will go to if I need um, if I if I need something that I'm sure will work 99% of the time. Um, yeah, or otherwise, like a Juno does the same thing, but for the upper upper mids and high frequencies to and like a sort of like widens the whole uh, the whole track when you put it on, for example, like a chorus or it's just very distinctive, you know. Uh, um, and I'm learning now the Bukla music is all because uh, yeah, I was really fascinated by it. Uh, you know, it's. Uh, Again, it's kind of like learning a new language. So you need to sit down and spend lots of time with it and uh, ask for help and uh, incorporate other people's technique with it. But yeah, it's uh, yeah, really into it at the moment. Wow. Um, so I know this, I'm, I'm kind of going off, off script here, but um, I know you also, I, I just learned this about you that you did the sound design for um, Sisters with Transistors, the, the film about uh, electronic music, um, women pioneers. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that, that sound design process and, and what, what led you to working on that film? Yeah, that, that was a great project to work on. I was really, really proud of it. Um, so I did a, a project with Katia Isakoff uh, called InCollab, and she brought together uh, me, Anil, and uh, Suzanne Chani and herself in the studio in British Grove here in London. And uh, so we made a record together, which was a privilege for me to work with all of them. Um, and at the playback, where we had a quadraphonic system uh, for the playback of the record, um, uh, Lisa Rovner was there, which is the director of uh, System with Transistors. And uh, she came to me and said, uh, I'm working on this film. And uh, I... I would love for you to do the sound design for it. And I was, uh, you know, I was really taken and for, wow, I would, I would love that. Sound design is one of the first, uh, um, one, of, one of the first jobs that I had. I mean, I was an assistant, wasn't a sound designer, but when I first started here in London, the first job I had, it was in a post-production house. Uh, so I went from Life Sound, Music College, London, finished that post-production. So to me, to actually put into, um, putting to work some skills that I learned 10 years ago for something that's been actually commissioned um, and for like a film that talks about things that I really care about. Like a, a lot of the uh, women featured in it are like my personal heroes and uh, my role models. So it, it just felt like a, an amazing opportunity. So what we did is we go in a studio together and uh, we thought about how we would approach the sound design, which uh, um, it was quite unique because being a, in a film about uh, music, um, we both wanted it to be fitting. The sound design wanted to be fitting amongst all the different pieces of original music from uh, uh, from the artists. So I wanted to be slightly more conceptual than just uh, you know mirroring an image that is on the screen. And I didn't want it to be obtrusive to the um, uh, to what was going on and the narrative. So I just wanted to be supportive, but yet to be you know creative and uh, that's why I, I use tape machines throughout it as well uh, for the sound design. For example, by bridging um, the narration of uh, with it being Dalia Derbyshire talking about uh, the Blitz in London uh, or, um, uh, not sorry, the Blitz, she must have been in, um, yeah, in her own town. And, uh, um, so talking about the sounds of the uh, uh, that were going on around her at that time, and what I did, I tried to uh, emulate what I thought she would have heard uh, with the tape machine feedback and just having that sense of like heroin and the feeling of the blitz going on around you. Um, and yeah, just it, basically I tried to to um, uh, convey feelings that. Uh, all of the protagonists of the film were talking about uh, through the sound design, sort of like to be there, but not be there as well. Um, yeah, that's this sort of approach that we used. That's, it's so interesting because I didn't know you did that. And we just recently, um, one of our 
local theaters here in San Francisco, they they just opened up again, you know, for in person. And the the film that they showed to open up for the first two showings was Sisters with Transistors. So they let us do a little intro to it um, for really Women's nice. Audio Mission, which was great. So then I heard this and I was like, oh, that's so amazing. I did not know that about you. So that was an interesting thing that I learned. Um, I want to touch on something just a little bit more technical for folks that might not necessarily understand this, but when you're talking about using the tape machine for feedback, how do you set that up? Like, how, how do you set that up? Let's say you're trying to process something, like, how do you set that up for, you know, the, through the aux sends and returns, and how do, exactly does that work if somebody wanted to try that out? So I will set, uh, set up a, a sense from the desk, like two cents, one and two, for example, going into the tape machine um, and then coming back on the tape machine from, from the tape machine and going back on the desk and on two channels, I will then, uh, the feedback will happen when the two cents on that channel straight will then be turned on, on the same channel. So that's effectively creating a, um, a feedback. Uh, then we'll make the tape machine then uh, start sort of like reacting to itself and that well that what that sounds like is basically depends on the amount of feedback and the speed that the tape is running at and uh, also it varies if you do change the speed of the tape if you do have uh, very speed but also buttons you know you suddenly you go from like uh, seven and a, seven and a half to 15 um, IPS then suddenly the uh, the tone of the feedback changes so it is this quite a simple kind of um, diagram of like a, uh, a feedback, but what it does, it, it's a lot. Uh, after discovering that, we started doing feedback on all sorts of equipment, <laughs> sometimes with like disaster results. Um, feedback doesn't work very well on valve equipment, I realized. It's a bit dangerous. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, I like that it's dangerous. <laughs> don't try this at home. Or we'll actually try it, but you know, uh, don't. Uh, let's not uh, uh, hold ourselves accountable <laughs> for the results. Um, it's great experimentation because suddenly you know it's a self-generating sound. I find that uh, it's really, really fascinating that from nothing, then a sound can be generated. And um, yeah, it's literally don't need anything else but the instrument itself. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's quite easy to, 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 to start playing around with it, uh, with just a, a mixer, a small mixer, it can be any mixer, you know, a small laptop, uh, sorry, a desktop mixer or, um, or a big mixing desk, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. It's so cool. Cause it's a mechanical feedback loop essentially, which, um, yeah, I think people just don't think of it. They think of, you know, tape machine, recording device. They don't think of it as like, oh, this could actually be a, a mechanical feedback loop, much like when you would use the tape machine for a delay, um, you know, and how, how you're setting that up mechanically to actually be that time difference, I think is is, is super, super interesting. Um, so I have time, I think, for one more question. Um, so I, I guess I wanted to talk about if there were any favorite types of tape that you need to use, because I'm, that's my personal uh, question that I am interested in here. Or is it just, it doesn't really matter. I guess it doesn't matter. Um, to me, well, I, when I buy a new tape, I buy a uh, 911. Uh, I quite like it because it's durable. I can record over it uh, lots of times and it lasts for a long time. So. Uh, if I am, for example, going into a project and I'm using the tape machines for something which I want to be quite defined, then I go uh, for a 911. I, I buy a, quite a lot of uh, tapes as well used because I like them and they're kind of buying a, someone's photograph, photograph album and you don't know what's on it. And then sometimes you can just put it on and you know, discovering that you can use it to like for like a starting point material for a composition. And it could be someone's recording um, an afternoon at home or recording like doing some field recording somewhere with an agra, who knows. Um, I do love the uh, kind of the, the mystery of uh, buying new tape and then sometimes those used tapes will have a different quality to them because it would be very old. So 
as long as they don't uh, shred, or actually that sometimes is a desired effect, but as long as they don't ruin my tape machine heads, then I'm happy <laughs> <laughs> with the old tapes as well. Uh, I think, um, yeah, it's, uh, I sometimes use uh, make tapes or tape loops and then I leave them somewhere to, to rest for a little while um, and then see what that does to them, what time does to them, or uh, what weather does to them. Um, uh, or sometimes when the uh, if a tape loop is running across the room, I just hold a um, um, a razor blade next to it and see if I can scrape off little bits of um, of tape. What that does, and when it comes back to the uh, to the heads. Um, so yeah, that's the sort of like my my tape um, <laughs> selections. Okay. You're deep. You're deep in there. <laughs> when, very deep. When, yeah, like if you're scraping off oxide, I'm like, okay, we're in a we're in a new realm of of tape use, uh, <laughs> which I love, love, love hearing about, and I I really appreciate you sharing all of, um, you know, your generosity and sharing that experience is is really uh, nice, and I really appreciate it. And it's um, a pleasure. I just thank you for taking the time today, and. Um, yeah, before I wrap up, I want to make sure if you all want to follow Marta's tape and vintage synth journeys on social, her handles are here and you should because it's super interesting. And my fingers are crossed because I know you're going to win producer of the year because you're the <laughs> producer of the year in our minds anyway. So um, thank you so much, Marta, for joining us today. And um, I hope we get to see each other in person soon. I hope so too. Thank you so much. You take care.